This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silence them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is episode 67, Megan Bomford, part two. In last week's episode, I told you the story of 17-year-old Megan Bomford, who died in Calgary, Alberta on October 18th, 2016, when the Jeep she was riding in lost control and rolled over several times. The vehicle was driven by her father, whose blood alcohol content was three times the legal limit. He was severely injured in the crash, as was Megan's 16-year-old friend, Kelsey Nelson. Megan's father was later convicted on four charges relating to Megan's death and Kelsey's injuries, and he is currently in prison. Although many local news outlets produced extensive coverage of the crash itself and the subsequent trial of Megan's father, none reported the family's backstory, including the years of psychological abuse Megan endured at the hands of her father and how that relationship culminated in the untimely death of a teenager. In today's episode, you'll hear my interview with Megan's mom, Lisa, and sister, Sarah, who paint a dark picture of a family life filled with alcoholism, abuse, and Sean's escalating erratic behavior leading up to Megan's death. This is part two of the devastating story of Megan Bomford. No sources for this week, but starting next week, by listener request, I'm going to start listing my sources at the end of the episode to shorten my intro a bit. Let me know what you think. I'd like to take a moment to thank my newest patrons, Missy from Alpena, Michigan, and Madison from Cheyenne, Wyoming. Thank you all so much for your monthly pledges. I can't begin to tell you how much I appreciate all of my patrons. If you'd like to help support the show and get me closer to my goal, you can visit patreon.com slash stlcpod. Thank you all so much. With that, here's my interview with Lisa and Sarah, Megan's mom and sister. Sean strikes me as very similar to a lot of people that I have talked about in the past on the podcast, on the blog. And people I've known very well in my personal life, unfortunately. So I I can relate in a lot of ways to the abuse that you all went through. Now, as the girls got older, did it shift more toward them and stay with you as well, Lisa? I feel like it was a household thing, really. Uh, We all got it. Sarah Mm -hmm. wasn't really a target for him because she's quieter. She was always what he thought more compliant. She's not as confrontational as Megan and I were. So he was always a lot nicer to her than he was to Megan. But he thought her not saying anything was her not having an opinion on it. But that was completely untrue. Um, She was actually the first to leave after I left because she's like, I can't live in this toxic environment. It was really, really bad after I left. But he was hostile mostly towards Megan and I because we would (laughs) confront him on his bad behavior. Whereas Sarah was almost more emotionally mature than even Megan or I because she was understanding that it was a him problem, that we couldn't fix it. And she just kind of was like, this is something you need to deal with, Dad. Like, this isn't my problem. So she wasn't basically spinning her wheels like Megan and I were because Mm -hmm. we were getting nowhere. But because we were always calling him out on his bad behavior, he really directed it to her and I the most. And her specifically after I left because of Ringette and being involved in, in her sport, he was really, really harsh with her. And he didn't have much of a relationship with Sarah after I left. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. It sounds like, Sarah, since you didn't escalate the situation by daring to confront him, that he kind of took that as more of an ally or at least a neutral party. And he he could focus his anger elsewhere. Yeah, he always kind of considered me his golden child. He never acted the way that he did with Megan. 
um, with me, but he used me more as like a, a therapist, like an emotional outlet. He would tell me about, you know, the few times that I would interact with him after my parents got divorced about how depressed he was. And he would cry and tell me all these things about how he wanted to kill himself. And I was more of a therapist to him. And then all of his anger would get directed at Megan. That's very manipulative. Yeah. He's very manipulative. He manipulates everybody, his family, us, the general public. He checks so many boxes on that narcissistic checklist. It's Mm -hmm. living with someone like that is just such an exhausting experience. And when you start as young as you did, Lisa, it it shapes your brain in ways that you don't even realize until you're out of the situation. I'm dealing with the fallout big time. I didn't realize it because for the the time that we were married, which it might have been 15 years before I left and even the time after it. It was all about him and and his needs and his issues. And then, you know, he gets you to question your perception of reality, who you are. I I didn't even know who I was when I married him. I mean, at 19, I I didn't have a clue. And then he, he made all the decisions. I had no ability to make any decisions. I couldn't spend any Christmases with my family or holidays for that matter. Even after my sister got diagnosed with cancer, I wasn't allowed to spend Christmas with my family. And I said I was going to take the kids and go anyways. And he said, basically over your dead body, I had to get my family to do it on a different day because he, my family didn't have any other children. Um, My older sister isn't able to have kids. And my younger sister, because of her cancer, had to have a full hysterectomy at 28. So she's not able to have kids. So the only grandkids my mom has out of three daughters is with my two children. And, um... He knew that my kids, especially when they were younger, wanted to see their cousins on Christmas and go play with them. So he always used that as a bargaining chip for the kids. Like, oh, who would you rather go to Christmas? Would you rather go with your mom and do nothing and be bored? Or would you rather go like to out to uh, his sister's farm and jump on the trampoline and play on the quad? And, and of course, they wanted to go there. Right. And yeah. I didn't want to cause grief for my kids. So I'd be like, it's fine. We can do it on Boxing Day, mm-hmm. even though it wasn't fine. I just wasn't going to bring my kids into that because that's what he would do. He would always put it down to if you want it, you're going to have to traumatize your kids. And I, he knew I would do it. And that's why he did it that way, because he knew I wouldn't play those games. So whether it meant putting them in danger or, you know, making them choose, he knew that I was always relent because, and he even said multiple times, you are a better person than me. In his moments of sobriety, he would acknowledge that he knew I wouldn't be like he was. So that's, that's what he did with me. And uh, if you were insecure about something... He would go after that. I have uh, mental health issues in my family. My grandmother is schizophrenic. He would accuse my family of being crazy, unsafe, which is absolutely ridiculous. My family is very safe. (laughs) If he knew you were afraid of driving, he would traumatize you. If you had any type of insecurity about your looks or your weight or your abilities, like he would pick on those and I sucked at everything and don't embarrass the family and you're making us look stupid. And it was all about putting on a show while we were out, you know, it was just psychological warfare 24 seven with this guy so that he always wanted it. So no one would believe me. So he always made me look like the crazy person. After I left him, he wouldn't pay child support. I wasn't going to fight him on it because again, I didn't know what he was going to do. I got a second job. I was working all the time. So he was always taking Megan to ringette. And I wasn't at her ringette games after that point, which is kind of weird because I was at them all prior. But she started playing for like a new area that didn't Mm -hmm. know me as well. And he said, oh, she abandoned her children. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. So when the accident happened, the ringette association that she was in at the time, they didn't know me very well. So I still felt like they were kind of supportive of him. I don't think he was actively coaching at that time because I do know that some people were concerned that they smelled alcohol on him on the bench. He was involved, but I don't think he was like head coach. No, he was more of an assistant coach, if anything. But he was there. He just wasn't in the same role that he had when we were younger. 
So he used to be a coach and he was much oh, yeah. more yeah. officially involved. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But, and it was also only with Megan's team. Like I still played for a couple of years after they got divorced, but he wasn't coaching for my team. He only got involved with Megan's team. And that's curious. Is it maybe because he wanted to be harder on her? No, she was a better player. <laughs> oh, hey. <laughs> Sarah knows. I mean, she just definitely had the ability and talent. Sarah is 4'11", maybe 100 pounds. She was small. She had some asthma issues growing up. She doesn't have the greatest lung capacity, so it did hold her back. She's a good player, but Megan kind of had, could possibly make it to the Olympics. And I think he saw that. Megan, he just roasted constantly because well, I, I think part of it, too, though, is like Megan responded to it. Mm -hmm. He could yell at me on the bench and I just wouldn't respond or interact with him. He knew that he could get her fired up. So he would be really mean to her on the bench. He would yell at her. He would shit talk her and it would get her more fired up on the ice. And he liked okay. that. I think he <laughs> liked having that control and like manipulation that if yeah, he got her mad she would get more fired up. Yeah. And she'd take it out on, on the ice rather than... Yeah. yeah, so she not only led the league in points, she also led the league in penalties. <laughs> yeah. She was She's a very so aggressive tough. player. <laughs> um, but that was really her only outlet for anything. Yeah. Like, that's okay. all she cared about. So having that power over the one thing that she cared about, I think he liked that. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like he he knew exactly which screws to turn in which yep. way for each member of his family and get exactly what he wanted. And then the gaslighting that you described makes you feel like you're losing your mind or makes other people think you might be. Oh, it's for so sure. hard. <laughs> I definitely thought I had lost mine. And I think other people thought that as well, because your perception of reality is really skewed because the relationships I was having outside of my home were somewhat normal. And then the perception he had of me was just so different. And I was like, wait a second, who, what am I then? Who am I? Am I a good person or am I a crazy, demanding, nagging wife? And people liking me outside of the home and then just having this vitriol inside of the home that made me feel like I was the worst person in the world, like the most nagging wife ever, which is I was completely not. And I would tell myself, I'm like, no, this is him. This is him. This is not you. But sometimes you just don't even know anymore. And the show he put on outside of the house was just completely different. So people were like, oh, he's the father of the year. He's the best dad ever. And because he was always coaching all of the kids' teams, but that's what he wanted. He wanted those accolades. He wanted people to think he was the best dad ever and that he loved kids and he loved coaching. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, he hated it. Mm -hmm. He hated doing it. He just loved people loving him. Right. Of course, yeah. it's all about image. Except for his family. He didn't care <laughs> that wow. if we hated him. That's the weird thing, because I used to say to him, why do you care so much about your outside persona? But you don't care what you're doing to your family and those people that love you and that are here for you all the time, every day, will do anything for you. You tromp all over us and, and you're trying to destroy us. You threaten to kill us. You terrorize us. Mentally, like Megan, Sarah was destroyed. I didn't realize until high school that she was completely falling apart because Megan was cutting herself. She was had a suicide attempt a few months prior. Um, she was not doing well either. And the day that she died, we had just come from a meeting at the school, me and Megan and her teachers and principals, um, because she had fallen so far behind at school and she wasn't on track to graduate. It was really emotional. And uh, we were driving home and I said, you know, Megan, I, I think you just need to stay away from your dad for a while and, and don't worry about Ringette. Like, we'll all deal with it. Him paying for Ringette was kind of part of the deal. And I had already talked to my parents who were mostly retired because uh, she has a lot of out-of-town tournaments. And I said, we'll all take care of it. They'll take you to your tournaments. We'll pay for it. Don't worry. But I think you need to stay away from your dad until he gets help because... She was also trying to get him formed in Alberta and Canada here. I don't know what they call it in the States. I think they might call 51, it 5150. 50. But they, I, we have forms here. 
So being held against your will is very difficult to do for good reason, but it, there's a lot of criteria that has to be met for you to be held even for 24 hours or a month. Um, and you have to keep renewing this. And, and she wanted, she, I work in healthcare and she kept asking me like, how do we get dad formed to put him in the hospital to get him help? And I said, Megan, it's going to be impossible because he's an alcoholic. So he's allowed to be an alcoholic. He has to be a danger to himself or others. So I said, if he ever talks about suicide, that's when you need to call the police. But I said, even then, he might only be in for two or three days. Uh, it's really, really rare to be held long enough for him to get treatment. And I said, if he doesn't want treatment, the whole thing is it's not going to be successful if he's not seeking it himself. You can't save him, unfortunately, because all she ever wanted was a sober, loving dad. And she fought and fought until he killed her. Megan just seemed like she was such an amazing person in so many ways and cared so much about people. Yeah. She loved family. She loved big family gatherings. She loved camping. She loved board games, card games. That was her dream life. Get married, have kids, have a big, loving family. She loved sports. Ringette was just a passion. She wanted to go to the Olympics if it ever got in. Um, she loved animals. She was funny, really funny. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. She lived 110%. I don't know many people that lived like her. So at the very least in the 17 years that she was here, she went balls to the wall with life. Uh, at the very least, she did get some fun times. She should have gotten a lot more, though. Her love and devotion to her father is what killed her. And that's what kills me, is he still doesn't care. She fought so hard for him to be a loving dad. Not just for her, for Sarah too, you know. And he just didn't care. And I just don't know how he could do that to her and still, like, not be accountable for it and to keep traumatizing Sarah. Like, after the accident, you know, she started university and delaying trials in the middle of her, her exams. I think the first time the trial got delayed, Sarah actually had to go into the psychiatric hospital for a while because of the stress overload mm -hmm. where she had gotten all of her exams deferred for the trial and he delayed it for a year. And he lied to her <sighs> and told her he was not going to do that. And uh, she snapped. I'm watching her fall apart. He's already killed Megan. He's killing Sarah. I mean, the fact that she's suicidal. Uh, she lost her only sibling, mm -hmm. her best friend. And now she just has me, who's damaged. Um, of course. And trying really hard to help her because, you know, he's still inflicting damage on her, um, even just from prison. And nobody understands, I guess, when someone's not leaving marks. And I think that's my biggest thing, that you have episodes where children are just like, I, I could have me crying at work when I'm listening to them. And I said, if they are getting returned to their families or their caregiver, how would anyone who doesn't have a mark on them be protected? Because I would have to make sure he uh, would not get custody. That's almost impossible. If he got his hands on them, if I had been able to leave him when they were younger, which I couldn't have, because he would have killed me, he would have took him and ran. Because I thought about it, my other option was parental abduction. Well, I can't do that because I would have had to run and go into hiding myself. Well, I'm not a millionaire. I have to work and I don't want to go to jail. Nobody would really take me seriously because of, of how he appeared in public. Like, how do you say a man who's the coach of your kids' baseball and soccer and ringette teams and hosting barbecues a bad father? He's a pillar of the um, community. I just want right. to say, too, right. about the That's like, not leaving marks thing. There was still, like, a threat of violence, yeah. even though he didn't really take it out on you specifically. So, for example, after my parents got divorced, like, he still punched a hole through Megan's bedroom door, mm -hmm. you know? But he just wouldn't lay his hands on you. But you right. were still always worried that something would happen. Even Kelsey told me that apparently he held a knife to her throat. After I had left, he used to, he tried to bribe the girls to hate me 
and mm-hmm. to also stay with him. So, you know, he bribed Megan with a puppy, but was so reckless that he uh, let the puppy escape and get hit by a vehicle in front of the house. And oh, uh, yeah, that was that was great. I was there it, to see that. Yeah. Oh, no. it, oh yeah. He uh, would tell he was drunk, she, obviously. But he would tell her she could have parties at the house. Oh, like, I'm cool, dad. And then come in completely drunk and enraged and pull knives and scream at people to get out of his house and punch holes through the walls. And There was a giant hole in the back foyer from where he punched a hole in the wall coming through the back door drunk during that party. The funny thing about that party, too, was is that Megan actually was not the one that asked for that. She was with me and my mom coming back from back to school shopping. And it was her two close friends that were like, hey, we want to hold like a party. And your dad said it was okay to hold it at your house. And she was like, what the heck? I wasn't really down for that. But she went anyway, because these boys that she liked were going to be there. And yeah, he came in absolutely loaded, drunk, and started screaming at everyone. Where the fuck is my daughter? Like, you better tell me where she is right now. She had locked herself in the bathroom so that he couldn't get to her. So then he found Kelsey and was threatening her and apparently pulled a knife on her and was holding it to her throat saying, like, where the fuck is she? Like, what the hell is going on? You better get all these people out of my fucking house. And eventually Megan comes out of the bathroom to confront him and is he's telling everybody to go the fuck home. And she's like, they're all drunk. They can't drive home. And he's like, I don't give a shit. Get them out of my house. Wow. That sounds like the mask slipped. He yeah. wasn't he wasn't worried about hiding. Well, not especially, in front of kids, like teenagers. Yeah. He didn't care what they thought of him. Also, I found, especially like after my mom left, he spiraled. Part of the reason that I stopped living at that house is because I would come home from school and he would be passed out on the couch. I thought he was dead. And I was like, I am not going to come in here and find my father had drank himself to death on the couch. Like, I just cannot mentally handle that. I'm not living here anymore. He had no food. It'd be like a jar of peanut butter and some expired milk because he was so drunk he barely had to eat. It was filthy, disgusting in there. I just bailed. I was, I couldn't handle it. I was like, if you want to drink yourself to death, you have to do that yourself. I'm not going to be the one that scoops up your dead body right. as a teenager just going into high school. And yeah, he he really spiraled after the divorce. Lisa, he had you kind of holding him in check to a degree. I think but... I just held the household in check. Yes. Yeah. It was more of like there was food there. It was clean. I just mitigated the I damage. I think also, he though, hit. he didn't have anyone to like to prove himself to anymore. Mm -hmm. So like he still had to be able to hold something over my mom's head while she was there. But if it was just me and Megan, he didn't need to prove anything to us because he had complete power over us as a parental figure. And then he could hold you two over your mom's head. Yeah, exactly. So if she wasn't in the household, he had no reason to even pretend that he hadn't been drinking because he didn't need to manipulate her. It is just so difficult to make people who have not been in this type of emotionally abusive environment, whether as a spouse or as a child, understand how damaging it is. And that's part of what I fight for all the time. And I'm constantly defending people in comments sections and things like that, because this comes up all the time. Well, why didn't you just leave? Or you should have done this. Or no one could possibly understand if they haven't lived through it. And it's once you're in it, it's so hard to get out, document everything. Just writing down everything that happened is it's important because your recollection is on paper and they are making up something that they may or may not remember because of the mental state or the intoxication and uh, any pictures. You know, even if there's not a lot of, of physical abuse, any pictures that you can take of it document everything that's the only thing i can think to tell anyone who's in it because it's so dangerous trying to get out like you said you see in the news what happens to a lot of women when they're trying to get out i just wish i had smartphones uh we there wasn't really anything in the beginning because i would have recorded it i didn't really have the ability at the time and me personally i think even with that i don't i still don't think it would have done anything because Unless he was given a life sentence, which he wouldn't have. He would have found me and killed me. So I just knew that if I was going to get out, I had to wait till the kids were older, hope that we made it, I guess, and try to tiptoe out. And it, it was still scary. 
I didn't know how it was going to go. I certainly didn't fight for what I was entitled to. So unfortunately, I walked away from my house. I walked away from everything. I've had to file for bankruptcy. I got no child support. People like, oh, why didn't you get alimony and child support? And why didn't you get part of your house? I said, because I would be dead. I can't Mm. fight a man who's not going to give me anything. He has so much hatred. He's like, I would rather destroy everything than for you. I didn't even get to take any of the kids' photo albums. He wouldn't let me take any of them. So I have no pictures. I had Facebook when it first started. So the first pictures I have is 2007. Um, So there's at least 10 years of pictures I don't have when they were babies. So I wasn't allowed to take any of that. And I just thought, you know what? I got them in my head. I have memories. I have my kids. Me, we can get out. Like, I'm not, I don't care. It's just money. I don't care. I just cared about safety and peace for once in my life. It was only maybe a few, two or three years later that he killed Megan. And it was, um, it was chaos the entire time that I had left him and, Um, It just culminated with that. So I I was just starting to look at myself and and look at all of the uh, issues, all the gaslighting and abuse had caused to me and my kids. And then we're dealt with, you know, the worst day of our life. And now we have grief on top of all of that trauma that we went through for 20 years prior that it's, it's a lot of unpacking. But I was saying that even though this is really, really hard for me to do, and I know for Sarah as well, um, the pain it causes me to talk about, it's that drop in the bucket to what these kids went through and what Megan went through. I mean, they lost their lives. Even though it's hard, I always want to uh, be a voice for other people in these situations, other kids in these situations, domestic partners that are in these situations that are just like, gaslighted to the point where they think no one will believe them, that they can't do anything, they're stuck, they're in danger. The law can only do so much and the law really fails us a lot of times, which is I went back to school because I want to hopefully make some changes in that department because I was quite frustrated with the uh, criminal system. I, I call it a legal system. I don't call it a justice system anymore. And all of the services, victim services that come into play fell really short, I found. And I was never involved in um, like family services. But a a lot of those issues are all kind of under the umbrella of what I want to to help with. And and I also, but I want to look at empowering young girls before they get into dating. Yes. um, To make better choices. Because if I had more self-confidence and knew how to set boundaries, I could have prevented even getting into this situation in the first place. So I want to kind of incorporate all of that into at least helping maybe prevent another person from getting into a relationship that to get out of someone's going to die. It just hurts because it's still happening every day. And people won't talk about it. Like for me, uh, for the longest time, like you're, you're ashamed. Right. You feel like you've done something wrong. You've been duped. Regret is, is such a powerful emotion and so hard to get rid of. I also remember saying, like, when my dad was an alcoholic, I have a lot of alcoholics in my family. I said, oh, you know, I'm never going to marry an alcoholic. So then I just look like a fool. I don't know. So you just, you didn't want to admit that you made a huge mistake. So then I, I thought, well, you know, maybe I can help him get sober and I can still restore this family. But then you realize it's a battle you can't fight the person who's in the throes of addiction. They've got to fight it themselves and he had no desire to. So, but Mm. walking away, unfortunately, wasn't an option for me because as long as I had children with him, he was very, very possessive of them. I actually wanted to interject for a second. You mentioned having to like defend people in the comments and a lot of people not really understanding like psychological abuse and alcoholism and everything. And that reminded me that after the accident, after Megan died and Kelsey was still in a coma, I, I tried to stay off the internet as much as possible. But unfortunately, a lot of people were sharing things. And the amount of people under news articles about what happened that were blaming Megan and Kelsey, like they shouldn't have gotten in the car with him. They should have known better. Instead of holding my dad accountable for being the guardian and the parent that was supposed to be looking after them, 
was just insane. Like so many people were jumping on the bandwagon to defend my dad and try to blame it on the two minors who he was supposed to be taking care of and protecting was insane. The like, amount of victim blaming that goes on is staggering. It's horrifying and it's disgusting. It really, that's one thing that gets under my skin to a degree I can't even describe. Well, and with, you know, functioning alcoholics, you can't tell. I saw a lot of people criticizing, like, how did you not know that he was drunk? It's like, that's all we know. We were raised by this man from the minute we were born. This is what we knew him to be. We right. only knew him when he was drunk, basically. We couldn't tell the difference. That was just our father. There was no way for us to tell unless he was actively raging at us. But if he was just coming to pick us up, we wouldn't have known. Yeah, it's so hard to tell when someone has a tolerance level that high and is mm -hmm. so used to pretending to be okay that you may not realize that they're not okay. And, and to blame the girls for getting in the car with this man, it lacks empathy to such a degree that you just don't even want to think that people like that are out there. But now you have had to see it yeah. firsthand and experience that. It's got to be infuriating. Yeah, it's mind boggling how someone can be like, yeah, it's this 17 year old girl's fault that she died because she trusted her father to protect her. And that's so unfair. And it's disrespectful to Megan's memory and disrespectful to Kelsey, who was trying to survive at the time. Yeah. And, and I mean, Kelsey, she was like a, another daughter to him. Like he had known her since they were young kids, like four years old. She right. trusted him like a father and trusted that he would not do anything to put her in harm's way. And yeah. he betrayed that. How is she doing now? She's doing good. She uh, definitely has some permanent traumatic brain injury. She really was on death's door. Yeah. But they had to what? take a lot of her skull off to let her brain swell out. She broke all the bones in her face. She broke her knees, blew her ACLs and MCLs. She her eyeball her came out. Her, her neck was broken. Her back was broken. Uh, so this happened October 18th. And when she woke up out of the coma, I said, every time I saw her, at first she was like five years old, then she was like 12 years old. And I was like, you know what? I think she's going to be okay. Like, I, we didn't know if she could walk, talk, have any brain capacity, really. We knew she wasn't brain dead, but yeah, we didn't know but if she... The, the doctors in the beginning were saying that she likely would have had to relearn everything with the mm -hmm. amount of damage that she took. And yeah. the fact that she even came out of the coma when wow. she did was borderline a miracle. She was out before Christmas. She wasn't... Wow. She, she wasn't down for long. Yeah, she was determined to get out of there. She yeah. hated it. Uh, she got out oh of the hospital gosh. without her skull back on. <laughs> yeah. Really? And ref yeah. Re she refused to wear the helmet that they told her <laughs> she needed to wear. Oh my gosh. They're like, if you hit your head, you're done. And she's like, I'm not wearing that thing. She wow. wore a tube, but that's it. Oh. <laughs> Mostly for aesthetic purposes. Yeah. Yeah, that's not going to protect you from much. But I, I imagine she felt fairly invincible at this point if she survived well, that. Well, I think at first she was almost uh, a little too childlike. So it was like, you know, Kelsey, you're just being a bit reckless here. You know, you just came out of a coma. Like, you're still pretty messed up. Like, please be careful. But over the past few years, she's doing better, but she definitely is like a bit slower processing things. Um, she still has all her language and she's capable. She can walk and stuff, but she definitely suffered. Catastrophic brain injury was her biggest issue. So you can see it kind of in her processing things. So jobs and stuff are going to be difficult for her for the rest of her life. But I think her biggest issue is her depression. I mean, she's just She's lost without Megan because she said, you know, Megan was her person. She's got survivor's guilt for sure. And, mm -hmm. and I just remind her, I'm like, Kelsey, if you had died, would you want Megan to give up? And she said, no. And I said, Megan does not want you to just throw in the towel after everything you've been through. She struggles emotionally for sure. But I hope that she finds a passion that will help her. I mean, she was only, what, 16? So she's, I think she's 20 now or 21. She's still very young. She's got a lot of life left to live. So 
I do hope that she finds something to bring her some happiness again because I do know she struggles emotionally not having Megan here because they were very close for the majority of their lives. She's very lonely without her, and she can't really play sports ever again either. She can never get a head injury. I mean, she's still missing some of her skull. Wow. It it just won't ever be there. Um, they can only put it back together to a certain degree. She had bleeds on both sides of her brain, so it was very touch and go. But she's a brave, tough girl, though, and I have all the faith in her that she's a fighter, so she really just deserves some goodness again. She definitely is an inspiration to anyone who's ever been injured in any way. We took her to Hawaii. We had to wait till she could medically be cleared because we wanted to take some of Megan's ashes. Maui was, like, on Megan's bucket list. So, um... I had never gone anywhere. I haven't even been to Mexico. I haven't been to Las Vegas, which most Canadians do. I haven't been anywhere because I wasn't allowed to go anywhere. So the fact that we were able to go to Maui as the first trip I've ever taken, it's the first time I've ever seen a palm tree oh. or pineapple growing in the wild. <laughs> and, uh, so Kelsey's birthday is July 25th and Megan's birthday is July 26th. So we took Kelsey to Maui for her, I guess it would be her 17th, because it was Megan's 18th birthday, and um, brought some of Megan's ashes to Maui. And uh, we found a beautiful rocky area with turtles, and there was a rainbow, and uh, we just sprinkled a little bit of ashes around there to make sure that she got to see Maui. And it was, it was really beautiful that we could do that. With all the video conferencing and virtual meetings going on these days, we all want to look our best. If you're like me, you're probably confused by all the different methods of teeth whitening on the market. Now that I'm partnering with Smile Brilliant, I've learned a few things that you might find helpful about home teeth whitening methods. For example, LED lights are a novelty item. Whitening strips neglect the gum lines, crevices, and molars. Charcoal is abrasive and wears down your enamel. And whitening toothpaste only works on surface stains. So if none of these miracle products really works, what does? The number one product recommended by dentists is the custom-fitted tray, which usually costs an arm and a leg because they require a dentist to make them by hand using a model of your teeth. With Smile Brilliant's Lab Direct process, you can get custom-fitted teeth whitening trays at a fraction of the price without a single visit to the dentist. Using an exact model of your teeth, Smile Brilliant's lab technicians will handcraft your trays to give you the best possible whitening results. All you have to do is visit smilebrilliant.com, and when you order their system, make sure you use the coupon code CHILDREN at checkout for 30% off. When you receive the package from Smile Brilliant, it's really simple. You just make your dental impressions at home and return them using the prepaid envelope they provide you. In a matter of one week, Smile Brilliant will have your trays back in the mail. Now, Smile Brilliant has something brand new to check out. On their website, you can also pick up a Carry Pro Ultrasonic Electric Toothbrush. This toothbrush is powerful, with 40,000 vibrations per minute, five brush modes, and one full battery charge lasts 30 days. Check out the deluxe, individual, and couples packages for the Carry Pro Electric Toothbrush. Using my coupon code, CHILDREN, means you're supporting me while saving a huge amount of money. So check out SmileBrilliant.com today. I'm just so glad Megan had such an awesome support system. She had the best mom and sister she could have asked for. And she had so many people who loved her. She she was obviously such a beloved person. She was, yeah. She would have done anything for anyone. And people knew that. So when she lost her life, the outpouring of love for her even surprised me. It was farther reaching than even I knew. But, you know, she was the type of person that would have given her life for you. She would have thrown a child out of the way and taken it hit by a vehicle. She would have not thought twice about doing something like that. She was just a champion for anyone. She loved fiercely. She could get angry and moody just like any other teenager, but she was just fiercely loving to her friends and her family. I remember thinking after she died... I was sitting in the hospital here 
we didn't know if Kelsey was going to make it. And I saw the sun come up the next day. And I thought, how is the world still going? It should have felt a shift. But I definitely felt and still feel like for all of those that loved her, we do feel that loss immensely every day. You know, a lot of the kids I talk about are very, very young. Yeah. But Megan lived to 17 and she was so close to adulthood and she knew exactly who she was. And that's just such a yeah. profound loss. She failed her driver's license, like I think two or three times. And it was frustrating because I thought, oh, if she had just passed, she would have been able to drive herself. You know, and like she was close. I think she was so close to freedom from him. And that's gutting because I think, oh, she almost didn't need him anymore to drive places. So she would have been able to keep herself at least safe in that way. It's not to say he couldn't have done something else. She should not have, in her last moments, known her father was killing her. Right. Those should not be a child's dying memories that my parent, who is supposed to love me more than anyone in this world, is killing me. That shouldn't happen. No, it shouldn't. He should have walked away from her. He should have took himself out of her life and said, I am not healthy. I am not well. I am going to hurt you. Just like any of those parents. That's what guts me is she knew she was texting me that her dad was going to kill her. And I can't reconcile that in my heart that that's how she died because she always said, dad hates me. And I would say, no, he doesn't, Megan. He loves you. He really does. He's just not well. And she's like, no, dad hates me. And I think she died believing her dad hated her. That's fucking horrible. It is. I will add to that, that she oftentimes would express to me, why doesn't dad love me the way that he loves you? Why doesn't he treat me the way that he treats you? It's so heartbreaking that any child can feel like they're not as loved as a sibling. And that has nothing to do with the siblings themselves. It has everything to do with that parent. He doesn't really love me either. He loves that I'm quiet. He loves himself and he loves anyone who makes he loves life himself. Him. Oh. And isn't that such a common theme that I notice that it tends to focus on one kid? Yep, it yeah. sure does. Family scapegoat. Yes. It and really it's, it's quite common that other kids in the household are well taken care of while one suffers. And whether it's emotional, physical, neglect, whatever it is, that child mm -hmm. suffers more than anyone else in that household. And it's just, it's inexplicable. You can't begin to imagine why that would happen. You touched on some key points in some cases that, like, whether it's they remind you of you mm -hmm. or remind you of someone you don't like. I do think that Megan reminded him somewhat of himself, but okay. also a lot of me. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of a lot of where it came from um, because he was really into sports, but he kind of abandoned his dreams. So I think he saw a bit of his failed dreams in her, but then he also saw a lot of me in her. So I think that's why she there was, was kind of, definitely yeah. a lot of you're just like your bitch mother. These people I, are... I think for me, it's just if I hadn't have even acknowledged that he had a drinking problem and just went out along my merry way, I mean, he would have been fine. He didn't like that I called him out on it. He didn't like me saying that he had a drinking problem. He didn't like me saying that uh, he needed to quit drinking. If you didn't say anything to him and didn't acknowledge his drinking problem, everything was hunky dory. And that's not something that most people can do. I mean, especially when you have to live with them day in well, and day out. Well, if you're out. spending 500 to to $1,000 a month on alcohol <laughs> alone, mm -hmm. um, you, I don't know, burn your house down because you're passed out while barbecuing, you're lighting fireworks off into the campground because you've got them pointed the wrong way and you're going to hit some <laughs> kid. I think people, even if you ignored the drinking, couldn't ignore what he was doing when he was drunk. It wasn't that he was just drinking and quietly sitting on the couch. Like he was drinking and encouraging the children to jump off the roof of the house into a pool, you know, just reckless, dangerous stuff. So it was like that on top of it. Who's going to get hurt today? So I had to constantly barter with him because he'd say like, I don't want you and the girls to leave me. And, and I would say, let's go to therapy, call your friend because his friend was a sponsor, get back to AA, like, we will help you, we're there for you, we will do anything you need. And uh, he would go for a while, but then he would stop and he would start with beer. He'd say, I can have beer. And then he would go to tequila. 
and then he would go to rye. So it was just like, and it was a cycle of that. So I realized I was going nowhere after four or five times of trying AA and stuff. So I was just trying to keep my kids alive at that point. That's all you can do. And you did everything you could do to make that happen. Yeah, without getting us killed for certain. I did try to leave when they were little, but that did not work out well. So I knew that if I left when they were too young, I would die. And Mm -hmm. then I certainly wouldn't be able to protect them. Yeah, it all goes to that feeling of being trapped. And when you're isolated, because you didn't live anywhere near your family at the time. No, I had no family here. I had no friends here. They were all his friends, all his family. Mm -hmm. Um, I had nobody. I had two small kids. I was young. Nobody really my age was having kids at that time. So I was very isolated. And he knew that. So Of course. He, I'm sure he orchestrated a lot of that. Oh, yeah. It wasn't until my parents moved here to help my sister when she got diagnosed with cancer that I found that was going to be my opportunity to get out. You can't overstress the, the importance of having someone to help you because just getting out of a relationship like that alone... Oh. It's overwhelming. It's terrifying. And when there's kids involved. And you don't have any money. Like I didn't have any money. So I needed a place to stay. I couldn't stop working. I had to take care of my kids. They were in school. I didn't want to disrupt their lives too much. I thought after I got out, I was like, I think we might have made it. I think we might have made it. Nope, we did not. That's one of the reasons that telling Megan's story is so important is spreading that awareness of what it looks like before you get in and what it looks like when you first get in and ways to avert such tragedy. It snowballs from the small red flags at the beginning into potentially something this catastrophic. That's exactly my mission in life now is to advocate for not just women, anyone. But obviously, it it is a higher proportion of women getting into these relationships and having children with these people in the first place. uh, It's a lot easier to get out and get away when you don't have kids. Once you have a kid, especially if you're married, uh, that other parent has legal rights. And that's when it starts getting scary because you can't just run away. You can't just leave change your name, move to a different town and start over, uh, which I would have done had I not had kids. But And I want to help younger girls before they start getting into relationships to understand the red flags, to know how to set boundaries and to believe in themselves and have some self-confidence. All of the things that I did not have. I just yeah. really would like to prevent, especially another mom, losing her child or her children through domestic violence. You shouldn't have to worry about your partner or the father or mother of your child being the one that kills them. I mean, those should be the people that you can say, at least they wouldn't hurt you. I don't ever want anyone to know what I've been through. And I don't want kids to go through what my kids went through. And it causes so much trauma to them as well that carries on into adulthood. There's no way it couldn't. It happens when their brains are forming. It it turns them into who they are and, and some things they really have to work hard to overcome. I've said it a number of times on the podcast and off. We need education for younger people about these relationships, even if it was in health class or in school. I don't know why they're not teaching kids in junior high about violence in relationships. I really don't know why they're not, because it is those are the formidable years. Mm -hmm. Those are when you're going through puberty, you're thinking about dating. I do not know why they are not focusing on that because it's it's a big problem. They could make it a part of sex ed. It's It all rolls into... Well, health yeah. and safety. The education system is really, really far behind. So I wanted to do something that I brought into schools or even did in uh, community centers to kind of complement the education system, which they just aren't really kind of getting up to speed quick enough. Maybe they will one day. I don't know. But how many children will have to die? It's not acceptable for me. So I talk as much as I can to the general public if if I can tell my story, if I feel that someone is open to it or maybe might be struggling themselves. I definitely take the time and talk with them and encourage them, um, especially younger girls that are just getting in relationships and that I say they don't sound good. They sound toxic. And I warn them and I tell them my story. And But I definitely want to take it to another level because I really think young people are just not getting enough warnings. 
No. And and these sorts of relationships are more being glorified oh, than yes. warned against. I mean, for example, the whole Twilight situation. Yeah. Wow. They create oh, yeah. such a huge impression on young girls and to teach them that this is the height of romance and this is what you should look towards. Oh, my. Well, look at that. <laughs> like Sarah, Sarah can totally talk on this because look at that um, series, You. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Yeah. Toxic. Definitely. Toxic. Stalking yeah. relationships are goals. Relationship goals. Right. No, they're not. Yeah. Like the no. entire plot is he manipulates them into thinking he's a certain person that he's really not. We're in trouble if these young girls think that these narcissists are exciting. It's not exciting when they're not pouring on the charm. And they're pouring on the charm. Oh, it's great. But wait till Absolutely. you see the other side of that. Exactly. So, you get them behind closed doors and the mask oh, comes off and that charm yeah. is nowhere to be found. No. It's horrible. So uh, I definitely want to bring more awareness to young girls with getting into relationships. If there's anything I can do to help with that, I'm more than happy to lend a hand. It's near and dear to my heart as well for extremely personal reasons. So that's a lot of the reason I tell these stories. They all yeah. kind of come from the same place. and For sure. I heard a lot of similarities with almost all of the episodes it's crazy how pervasive these yeah. attitudes are. Yeah. And just once you're in, it's, it's almost impossible to get out. You might not see physical signs, but that child right. is still being abused and that child is still in danger. The emotional signs might be more evident than the physical ones in a lot of cases. So we can't just look for the bruises and the, no. and the cuts. And it's It's got to be more than that. So the more awareness that we can spread, the better. And that's exactly why I'm here. And that's why we're talking right now. And unfortunately, you had to learn this the hardest possible way. And I'm so yeah. sorry for your loss and Sarah for your loss. And Megan just, I mean, I never met her and I love this kid. Just, just from what I've been able to find of her, she's just a real once in a lifetime person. Firecracker. Firecracker for sure. Yeah. Her she, sense of humor, oh, yeah. just from the little bit I was able to see, she oh, would yeah. have cracked me up. <laughs> oh yeah. She's, she's funny. And she could remember lyrics the first time hearing a song. Like she was, wow. just, she was just funny. She was hilarious and uh, just a huge personality and would light up a room when she walked in. And it's, yeah. it was very quiet after she died. Mm -hmm. she, she was loud. <laughs> <laughs> she was loud. Yeah. yeah, you don't realize how much you'd miss it, unfortunately. Well, I, no, I, I said, she texted me constantly. She would just be like, most teenagers, they'd be just giving you a play-by-play -play of their day or be like, oh, I hate this class. I'm so annoyed. I just want to, and I would get texts like that all day or I need $20. Can I go here? Can you give me a ride? I'm hungry. Get me McDonald's. Give me chicken nuggets. And then all of a sudden my phone is just silent. The silence was, was deafening in the beginning because Sarah just wasn't as talkative. So I was like, what happened? Yeah. It's like you didn't, you weren't a mom anymore. I saw a couple of your, your interviews too. And just my heart is just broken for you. It's, I can't imagine how you process all of it. I think I'm still processing it. Of course. Just know you did everything you could to get the kids out of the situation and to protect them in every way you could legally do. Yeah. And Megan was lucky to have you just like you were lucky to have her. Yeah, we were. But I wish she didn't live a life just to die at 17. It hurts. You know, it's like, oh, well, yeah, I had her. At, I had 17 years with her. But I wish she just never knew that life at all. In all honesty, I wish I could have just prevented that life of misery for her. And I feel bad because I made the choice to marry this man and trust him and, and have children with him. And that was the result of her life. And it, it just makes me sad for her because she had plans. She had money on her dresser. She had a hamburger in the fridge. She had her shoes at the front door. She had a life that was just completely unfinished. And uh, it hurts. Every birthday I have, I keep thinking, can I give Megan the easy years? Because I don't want them. Even my mom says the same thing. She's like, I wish I could give Megan some years, you know, to have kids and get married and have experiences and travel because it just, you know, they just get ripped off. These kids, they just get ripped off and it's not fair because they did nothing to contribute to it. They didn't make bad choices. They did nothing. 
they were just being kids and trusting their parents. And that's why they died. And it's hard to reconcile it. It did not need to happen. She did not need to die. She should still be alive today if it wasn't for her father. You know, the photos that he burnt, that's one thing. But the memories, yeah. you will always have. I always have. have the memories and he can't take them away from me. So that's right. he's not going to win. No, absolutely no. not. And you'll never give up. And no. Megan will never be forgotten. There's no. absolutely no doubt about that. Not as long as I'm alive. <laughs> that's for sure. And I, she'll live on even far beyond. I mean, you know, the internet is forever and that's true. There's so that's much true. information out there and, and some of her stuff is still out there and, and her friends, her presence will be felt for a very, very long time. I know just with me and my cousins, we, she still gets brought up at every family gathering. We don't care how uncomfortable it makes some people. We're not going to stop talking about her. I'm I'm glad you both have a lot of great memories to hang on to. We do. I'm honored to be able to help tell her story and keep Megan's face in front of people and, and let them know her a little bit. We're just so thankful that you're willing to tell her story because maybe one person will even hear it and it'll sound familiar to them. If we can't eradicate it, we can at least lessen it until right. we can. We can but, educate. Right. And I'm just really, really thankful that you're doing what you're doing because the death of children makes people uncomfortable and they don't right. want to talk about it. They just want to pretend like it doesn't happen because it bothers them. And I said, nope, you're going to have to hear about it because there's people that are living this every day and uh, it is uncomfortable and it's horrible. So we need to pay attention to it because we need to do something about it. So I'm just really, really thankful that there's people like you that are doing this and that you even you know, want to talk about Megan because it, it is isn't the most sensational story and a lot of times they pick the more sensational ones because they the visceral reaction might get people to notice more but there's a lot of just covert abuse and it's in all shapes and sizes and I just hope to reach more people with mm -hmm. her story that it just may resonate with and uh, maybe they can reach out for help or, or advice or just anything support moral support even nip I, it in the bud, you know? Yeah, I would yeah. say to maybe bring some awareness to people in that if someone does reach out to you to take it more seriously, because it's not like me and Megan never approached people about this for help. We constantly, especially to my dad's parents, were begging for help every time we saw them. And most of the time while we got in response was, well, maybe if you spent more time with him, he would stop drinking. And no help. Nobody took us seriously. You know, I, I think there's definitely some guilt on my grandparents end for even blaming Megan or our behavior for my dad's alcoholism. Like, oh, maybe if you weren't so rough on him, oh he wouldn't gosh. be drinking so much, you know, or you're a brat anyway. So that's why he's treating you the way that he is. That's unbelievable. Yeah, it's not like we never asked for help. We did, but nobody took us seriously because, again, that physical aspect wasn't there until, you know, she died. Right. And then all of a sudden, everyone was like, how could this happen? We never saw it coming. And it was really a slap in the face because, especially to me, I was like, we talked to you about this. We asked you for help and you turned your nose up at us. That's definitely something that needs to be addressed. And, and that kind of awareness is important, too. I mean, we always tell people, keep an eye out, you know, always say if you see something, say something. But if someone is flat out telling you to your face, there is a major problem here and they're ignoring it. That's a whole different situation. Yeah. And someone doesn't have to be physically violent to end up killing their child or, or someone in mm -hmm. their family. It can happen so called out of the blue. And this particular story shows that, I think, in a very unique way. And it, that's why it's important to tell the story. And also because Megan deserves her story to be told, not just what happened to her, but who she was. And so I, I'm just glad that we can pay tribute to her by maybe helping other people. And she would want that. She would want to help other people. So as hard as it is for, for Sarah and I to talk about it, it just means a lot to us to, to get Megan's story out there and to have a legacy that's positive, that she couldn't be here to create positive change, but maybe her story can help in some way. She did not live in vain and she didn't die in vain. So no. we can make sure of that.
The strength and perseverance Lisa and Sarah maintain is inspiring, and I want to thank them both with all my heart for opening up the way they did, for taking us inside the years-long nightmare they experienced, and for telling us about Megan and what a special, loving person she was. We can never let Megan be forgotten. That's it for this week. Join me next week for another case. If you like the show, please follow or subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. And please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. You can also subscribe on YouTube by searching Suffer the Little Children Podcast. Visit the website at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod.com where you can listen to episodes or become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to exclusive gifts. Follow the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, and Pinterest at Suffer the Little Children Pod, and on Twitter and TikTok at STLC Pod. View photos related to today's episode on Facebook and Instagram. For more stories like the one you heard today, visit SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com. This podcast is researched, written, hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. Intro theme music is by Dream Note Music, and all music for the show is licensed from audiojungle.net. Email tips, comments, questions, or case suggestions to suffer the little children pod at gmail.com. For more information about preventing or reporting child abuse, visit childhelp.org or call your area's child abuse hotline. If you see something, say something. Until next week, bye everyone. <laughs>